uh, very welcome to all of you to the 2020 Milken Institute Summer Series. And on behalf of CNBC International as well, I want to welcome you guys to a very, very special conversation with His Excellency uh, Walid Al Muhari. Your Excellency, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for thanks for the warm welcome, Hadley. Sorry we couldn't do this in person, but I guess this is, this is what we get. <laughs> One, <these> day. <laughs> One day. One day. Hopefully no, soon. Exactly, exactly. Now, as Deputy Group CEO and CEO of Alternative Investments and Infrastructure at Mubadala, um, you have a very clear insight, I would imagine, into what kind of uh, things that investors are really looking to put their money into at such a delicate and frankly confusing time. Um, before we kick off, I really would love to get your perspective on where we're headed. A lot of conversations right now surrounding the volatility of markets, um, frankly, the fear factor, um, getting the narrative right, uh, not just as governments and policymakers, but also as investors as well, speaking to employees, um, value investing, ESG. Walk us through how you see all of this evolving. So, so I think COVID just has, has really been an unprecedented time in so many different ways for us. And, and ultimately, I think one of the key insights that, that I've heard, and, and I'm sure you have too, is that COVID really has, has sped a lot of kind of really big trends uh, up as a result of, of the pandemic. So, for example, you know, things like, you know, working from home, what we're doing right now, uh, what, what is happening with commercial real estate, the idea that, that you know, you don't, you don't need to obviously be face to face to do every little thing. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that most of the folks on this call would travel at the drop of a pin, right? Just to go see somebody and have lunch. Well, of course we would. And that's <laughs> because, because we could be just as productive as, as we thought we could be by doing what we're doing right now. So if we have to think about how we navigate, you know, the investment world, first of all, there, there are no easy answers. And, and what I tell everybody and what I tell folks in my organization is just follow your conviction. So one of the things that we do is we try and be conviction led from an, from an investment perspective. And right now, happy to share with three or four kind of broad themes that I think are helping sustain us as we think through how we deploy capital during, uh, during COVID-19 and frankly beyond. So I think number one, uh, certainly technology. Technology is changing the world, and making the right technology bets, I think, I think will serve us very well. And and that's everything from from you know e-commerce to the delivery of goods to you know venture. Venture is incredibly important right now because because given that we're at an inflection point, if you're able to figure out or at least have conviction around where the world is going, then obviously you can make the right types of placements of capital that I think will will create outsized return. So I think that's category number one. Category number two is in biotech, healthcare, and life sciences. We're doing a lot of looking around and investing in that space. And by the way, it's not just because of COVID-19, but it's certainly accelerated by COVID-19. So when you look at the nexus of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in, in healthcare and certainly in biotech, the opportunities are tremendous. We have at least you know, five to 10 different companies in, in that space across Mubadala, and we're looking for, for many more. So that's just two examples out of many in terms of how we think about conviction-led investing during this time. Your Excellency, I want to follow up on the healthcare aspect just, just of that. Just one minute, please. <laughs> we'll leave. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on the healthcare part of that because here in sure. the UAE, you have the highest per capita testing of any country in the world. That obviously perhaps lends itself to some insight about where you could be putting your money to make us most impactful. So, so I think the most important insight that comes out of that, that massive testing is that it allows leadership to make fact-based decisions. And, and, and you know, th th that's just such an important thing. It, it helps us decide, for example, when to, when to open up restaurants. It helps us decide what those operating hours should be. It helps us decide, you know, are there segments of society, for example, over 70s, that maybe ought to have a slightly different program just because mortality rates and infection rates are a little bit higher when you're in that age group. So, so once you have as much data as we do, it allows you to figure out and, and manage this, this really unprecedented set of circumstances. And that's something that I think, that I think leadership has done. And, and we have been at the forefront of providing some of that data to them through our large healthcare, uh, healthcare assets here in country, whether it's Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi that treats the sickest of the sick, uh, our reference lab that has done, you know, something like 6,000 tests a day and has completed a grand total of, you know, at least 150,000 tests 
since uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, all these different things put together uh, essentially allow you to to try and figure things out and put your arms around something that really has been unprecedented and hasn't occurred during any of our lifetimes. Well, Lee, give us a sense um, from your investor's perspective of how close we could be to finding a vaccine at this point, because there's a so lot of... There's there's a huge amount of speculation, and I'm not a physician, so so you're gonna have to take anything that I say with 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 a grain of salt. But at the end of the day, the people who actually know the best are the folks who are hosting this 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 program. So I know that Milken has done a huge amount of work in tracking vaccines and really have dug into the science in terms of what this looks like. You know what what we've done is is you know we're following the science as closely as we can as lay people. But I think what really helps is, is that because we run a large healthcare system, we're able to tap into a huge amount of expertise, both here in country and, of course, our colleagues in Ohio at Cleveland Clinic. And so we've been able to tap that. We have a, a, an actual vaccine board that helps guide us through which, uh, which vaccines seem most promising, which therapeutics will help us kind of weather the storm until the vaccine comes out, and what are the, what are the most kind of impactful things that we can do depending on uh, on kind of what what befalls us so so the truth of the matter is 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 the, the main in, in, insight that i think i'd like to leave everybody with is you know it's not about having all the answers but it's really about tapping into a network of trusted colleagues who really know what they're talking about to try and navigate this and through that you know you're you're hopefully able to make you know sound decisions which i think we have um i believe your ceo you know interview just a few days ago with a network that shall remain nameless because it wasn't mine, um, was speaking about uh, where he's looking to put uh, Mubadala to work. And he mentioned Asia as an area for potential investment. When you think about this with regards to the healthcare sector in particular, what's attractive to you about those markets today? Lots of exciting things happening in Asia, Hadley. So, so you know, you, you look at Chinese biotech companies, which, which truthfully have been a little bit of a mystery to, to I think, Western investors uh, for, for no reason other than, you know, Western markets are huge anyway. And so people just haven't found the time to build the expertise. But you're seeing more and more of that happen. So one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to get in on the ground floor. We wanted to build those relationships. We want to understand the regulatory environments in China and other Asian countries so that we can participate in what's likely to be uh, uh, a sector that's going, to, that's going to grow very quickly. And in terms of what happens next with regards to your investment um, strategy, how do you adjust to the new normal? I think that's something that everybody's talking about. And that's across infrastructure. It's across investment plays as well. Um, and frankly, what, what the new normal is going to look like so, so at the end of the day, I think, I think I'll go back to what I started with. And so you've got to have conviction that, that the risk and the reward are in balance, because that's ultimately how, how we think about every single investment that we make. So when we try and measure risk during these uncertain times, you know, sometimes, sometimes whether it's geographically based or asset class based or sector based, you know, the new normal adds another premium to that and another level of, of uncertainty that we have to try and wrap our minds around. So at the end of the day, you know, it, it just adds another, another variable, if you will, to the way that we try and model out risk. And I, and, and I guess, you know, the real, the real trick here is figuring out whether the return that you're going to get is going to be commensurate with the risk. If you called the risk right, then you're probably going to get the return right as well. And, and so that's why we spent a huge amount of time trying you, to figure out what could go wrong every time we deploy capital. Go ahead. It's Andy. a tough one, though, isn't it? Obviously, um, when you think about events like COVID-19, a black swan event, for example, it's very difficult to strategize and plan around that. Something that obviously we've seen in the last several months has been defaults on REITs. We've also seen um, a growing concern about um, traditional um, real estate assets versus digital assets. Where do you see um, the disconnect there trending? So, so, so it's interesting. I'll give you a very personal kind of set of disconnects. So as, a, as an institution, Hadley, you know, just like everybody else, when, when COVID hit, markets were extremely volatile. Nobody knew what was going on. And most folks stayed on the sidelines. There was absolutely no shortage of cash in the system. There's tons of cash floating around. It just wasn't being deployed because folks were trying to figure things out in exactly the way they, that, that you're asking about. I think, I think what was special about us is that, is that I think we deployed at, hopefully, and I hope I don't eat my words later on, you know, three or four or five years from now, 
but I think we started deploying at the right time. And I think a great example of that is, is our recent geo investment, which you might have heard about. So there we partnered together with, uh, with Mr. Mukesh Ambani. We, we, we took, a, took, took uh, I think, a pretty strong position in what we think is, is a great positioned telecommunications plus type of company centered in India uh, that, that we think is going to hopefully have outsized returns over the next four, five, six years. And so there, conviction led, we invested about $1.2 billion, large position for us in the middle of a high degree of uncertainty. But listen, we think, we think this is something that's going to play out reasonably well for us. And the truth of the matter is companies like Facebook, General Atlantic, KKR, and probably a dozen other countries came in and invested in the same company. Does that go beyond a regulatory environment that might be hostile to that kind of action in the sense that, you know, we've seen so much pushback, as you mentioned, you mentioned Facebook and Google, they're facing a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles in the United States, in Europe as well. I mean, certainly COVID-19 has put so much on the back burner. Um, is this the time, do you think, to move ahead with, with investments that at other times might, frankly, be more questionable? Or is this the time to sit tight? So, so I don't think about it that way. So, so I, I never like investing in things that are questionable because <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I don't think that, that, that's good. Well, you might get a more sizable return. <laughs> so, so we try not to do that. We, we don't chase every last bit of return. So again, what, what we like to do is we like saying, look, are we, are, are we taking a reasonable risk? And, and ultimately in GEO, we thought that we did. And that there's many other examples. So, so we're, we're, we're in the middle of three or four very large deals at the moment that we think fit into that same kind of category whether it's the geography, the sector, the partners. And listen, we may not be right on all of them, but I think, but I think the truth of the matter is, is that we're taking a reasonable position that we think uh, is going to result in, in outsized performance. I mean, again, at, at the risk of kind of prognosticating and thinking about what the future looks like, I think that if we're able to, to invest in the right way, the vintage 2020 placements, so those investments that we make in 2020 are likely to be defining I would say in about four or five years. So, so we're probably not gonna know uh, till then, but I just have a feeling that this is a pretty singular dislocation across many, many different sectors. So those placements that we make are really gonna be defining. When you think about this with regards to investing in healthcare specifically, um, the bricks and mortar, um, when we're talking about um, assisted living and, and home care, what are some of the areas that are of particular interest beyond vaccine investing? So, so give you one, one example. So, so it's not the areas that you talked about, but we're seeing, we're seeing a great trend and everybody's seeing this around the world. Right now, you know, folks just simply, unless they're very, very sick, are not going to clinics and hospitals. They're fearful and, and you can't blame them, right? And, and, you know, folks are asking questions like, well, where have all the heart attacks and strokes gone? Because, because the numbers have just plummeted. And I think the sad truth is, is that folks are unfortunately staying at home. So one of the trends that I think is going to be irreversible once we're able to find the right technical solution is going to be, you know, teleconsultations and stay-at-home medicine. You know, are there things where, where you can either send the medical professionals home? Is there a way to harness technology through your phone, through your iPad, through your PC, whatever it might be, so that certain types of diagnoses can be done, taking, taking you know, the, the load off of hospitals, giving people the comfort that they need, reserving hospitals for things that, frankly, you can't do remotely like heart surgery, like you know, dealing with a stroke, all that type of thing. So the type of intervention is going to change. And I think that's an inexorable trend. And we're investing right in the middle of that. And, and hopefully, we think we're, we're in that sweet spot. So that's one of many examples that you'll see in healthcare. Apply, apply that to other sectors then, um, because I still have this feeling, um, and I've had to see several doctors, thankfully not for COVID-19 in the last few months, and, and I still have this this need to get in front of somebody and explain it to them face to face. But as you say, I mean, given the circumstances, there is a fear factor involved. What are some of the other areas you see that same kind of technology applying? I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a great question. So, so some of the things that we're learning about from a healthcare perspective, you know, you're also seeing, strangely enough, in real estate, which, which is not an area that, that you, know, you would necessarily associate with technology, right? But, but you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a little example. So, so initially we thought, boy, you know, since we can do everything on Zoom or, or, or Blue Jeans or whatever, whatever kind of the app du jour happens to be, you know, does that mean that it's the end of commercial real estate? Probably not. You know, I think commercial real estate is probably going to take a little bit of a dip, 
but certainly technology is going to reshape the way that we think about commercial real estate and how we use it and how we deploy people and who needs to stay at home and who can work in a satellite office and campus. And so, you know, the pandemic plus technological solutions will change an asset class like commercial real estate, which frankly hasn't changed very much in the last 35 years. And so it's going to be pretty disruptive, but I think towards, towards the better. And you're seeing that, you know, again, not just in real estate and healthcare, but you're seeing that in virtually every, uh, every industry. When you think about um, the planet in regions, if you will, for investment, we spoke about Asia, you talked about India as an investment destination as well. But when you look at the mature economies in the West, um, particularly in the United States, um, and you think about this against the sort of panacea of history, um, a lot of volatility in the markets, but frankly, um, in governance as well over the last couple of years there. As an investor, do you still see the United States as a major place to put your money? Undeniably so. So, so, so it's still the largest, deepest market on earth. You know, whether it's the equity market, whether it's the debt market, whatever, whatever it might be. And so, so you know, private equity, debt, uh, uh, venture capital. I mean, the U.S. is still the epicenter of, 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 of investment, for, certainly from our perspective. And, and I think most people would agree with that statement as well. So, so obviously, volatility is not your friend. And that's in spite of COVID and in spite of whomever might be in the White House. Look, it's it, it, investment, investment follows opportunity, right? And so where you do see that opportunity, as long as you think that the playing field is, le is level, then you are going to deploy capital. And, and right now, you know, from a risk award perspective, notwithstanding all the stuff that, that you're talking about, risk award is still pretty good in the United States. And, and we are deploying money in the United States. And I don't think that that's going to change. What about Western Europe? So Western Europe is also a pretty important destination. Uh, you, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, you know, just, just think, of, th think about those three, three countries. I think certainly starting, starting with France, we, we just recently announced a partnership with BPI France where, where we had contributed a billion euros in, in their Lac d'Argent fund, which would seek to take positions in, in some of their large uh, publicly listed companies uh, that I think have been undervalued as a result of COVID-19. So there, you know, it, it was a pretty simple proposition for us. Good partner, strong fundamentally speaking, uh, companies uh, at their heart that, that, you know, once we feel hit the right price thresholds, you know, we're, we're very comfortable deploying capital into. Germany is, is, is a powerhouse from a small to medium-sized enterprise uh, perspective. I think everybody knows that. Lots and lots of opportunity from an industrial perspective, from a technology perspective. I mean, if you go to Berlin and look at the VC community there, it is alive and buzzing. So huge amounts of opportunity in places like that. Any place you wouldn't put your money now? No, I don't, I don't think about it geographically, Hadley. I think, I think in many ways, it's, it's about the opportunity. I mean, look, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, at investments in Brazil, for example. And so right now, you know, Brazil is pretty hard hit by the pandemic. And, and you're seeing that, you know, folks are still trying to get their arms around what's happening down there. But I tell you, the, the pipeline that we currently have in Brazil is deeper than ever before because we're seeing a huge amount of opportunity caused by that uncertainty. So, so it's important to, to, again, you know, volatility doesn't mean there is an opportunity. You just need to be well positioned in a place like Brazil and hopefully take advantage of a situation like that. Before I let you go, Your Excellency, I want to ask you specifically about um, challenges you see on the immediate horizon. Uh, because we've seen a great deal of difference between what the market has, has been doing in terms of um, skyrocketing off the back of uh, what was essentially the good news about a return to work um, globally. And at the same point, we're seeing a difference in the real economy, particularly in the United States and Europe as well. Um, here in the region, we're seeing lower oil prices obviously hitting hard at uh, petrodollar economies. What do you think is going to be the greatest challenge in the next six to 12 months? Well, I think it's going to be it's going to be managing the one-two punch of uncertainty together with with I think the health challenges that all of us are facing. So so ultimately, how you navigate that is really going to going to answer that question. So so you know nobody knows how the pandemic's going to play out. We've heard every theory under the sun. There's going to be a vaccine. There's not going to be a vaccine. The virus is getting weaker. The virus is getting stronger. So I'm not going to place a bet on that. You know, it's not, There's a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery. That's right. And, and so, so I'm not in the prediction business. 
But what I am is in the risk mitigation business. And so what that means is, is again, if I, if I think I can find an opportunity that's going to be robust, even under difficult circumstances, I'm going to want to put capital there. And that's, that, that's how we try and navigate this, this time. Your Excellency, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Hadley. Thanks for inviting me.